Oscar series of the year. And our next is actually gonna be on February 28th in here um, with Stephen Dupin, who is here, who's gonna be presenting. So we hope you'll be back on the 28th for our last um, seminar of this quarter. I also wanna make an announcement that there's gonna be an Acacia lecture in African Studies um, February 27th from 5 to 6.20 p.m. in McKinsey 123. And it's gonna be um, UO students who have recently done internships or study abroad experience in Africa presenting about their experiences. So if you're an undergraduate interested in doing um, study abroad in Africa or internships, we really encourage you to go. Um, I also want to thank the sponsors of the African Studies Lecture Series, some of whom include Global Oregon, the Oregon Humanities Center, the Department of Biology, uh, Environmental Studies, all very grateful. There's tons of seats up here, comfortable ones. <laughs> um, so today we have with us Dr. Jocelyn Mueller. She's a self-described ethnobotanist. She received her PhD from Tufts University in Biology. And her research focuses on, is very interdisciplinary, and is both cultural anthropology and ecology. So she's going to be presenting today um, research based on her dissertation, which is um, in Niger, a place that she's been working at continu fairly continuously since 2001, when she was a Peace Corps volunteer there. Um, she's currently based in Portland, Oregon, and teaching at Portland State University. And she's got a new project related to wild food policy in Portland. So we're very grateful that you can come and join us today. And we're looking forward to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And um, well, I thank you all for inviting me. And um, I will apologize right now for my voice. Um, I have a bit of a cold. And this is actually a lot better than it was this morning. So that's why I have all these special microphones. Um, but yes, I'm talk I work interdisciplinary. My, my field is ethnobody, so ethnobotany. And so it looks at how people use plants. And specifically, I look at the, the knowledge people have of plants, so how um, traditional knowledge, local ecological knowledge, how this knowledge can inform conservation. And I do that, um, I've d done it predominantly in West Africa, in Niger, um, but that's what I'm looking at now, hopefully to expand into Portland area. So um, to give you a little bit, take you out of the, the African society into the abstract theoretical society, um, I wanna give you a little bit of background on where this is coming from, from the theoretical standpoint. So, in science, uh, um, we look at the kind of the process of the way knowledge moves through societies from the stage of where it was acquired. So in a lot of Western societies and a lot of global um, communities are built on that um, same framework. It comes through Western science um, where research, experimentation, but also observation, life lessons that people learn. Um, and then that, that knowledge is applied in management regimes um, through the way we um, manage our landscapes, manage our forests, manage our gardens. Um, to, and then it's codified in policy, in laws, in best practices, in, in um, different guidelines that we ha our societies have. And this process um, is not exclusive to Western societies or global, um, global communities, um, but it's really found in, even, um, in all kinds of societies. And there are different techniques for ma ma managing for managing, and there are different techniques for acquiring that language, but or acquiring that knowledge. But that process of moving from observation, experimentation, on uh, to acquire knowledge, moving to apply that knowledge, and codifying that knowledge, if it's not in law, in customs and beliefs and traditions, is a process that we've seen all around the world. And so the question, so because um, Western scientists have rec a lot of Western scientists have recognized this. They've um, simplified this in this, um, Burke calls it the knowledge practice belief system. I like to use the term custom because it's not simply beliefs, there are traditions involved and, and local laws as well. Um, but people have argued that these, is there, is there not a way to link the way traditional societies gather, inquire knowledge, apply knowledge, um, codify knowledge, and the way some Western society, societies do this? Um, is there even a se separation? And so they, there have been a lot of movements, even in the ecology side, uh, also is from, from the anthropological side, to try to unify these systems, to figure out what are the commonalities, how do we, how do we bridge the, um, the differences in techniques to allow for the improvement for both. And my research comes from using, um, comes from the idea 
is centered around the idea that we use participatory research techniques, which is a set of techniques that's come mostly out of the anthropology world as a lens to look at these two um, knowledge systems, to look at both the way Western scientists gather knowledge and the way traditional knowledge holders, local knowledge holders, um, also gather knowledge. And can we use this participatory research technique as a way to fuse these two systems? So my guiding question in all of the research that I did under my at my dissertation was how does participatory research help to integrate local and global knowledge, and how does this process change the research outcome? And that first question is really important to, especially anthropologists, is on how does this happen, what, what is happening, but how it changes the research outcome is really what the, the answer you need to know in order to sell this to ecologists, because they're the ones who um, from their perspective, they have validated techniques and methods for get, gaining information about a community of, of plants, for example. Um, and if you're now changing that method, they want to know how are you changing that outcome. And to do this, to think of this process of integration, I, did, I looked at different stages of the research process. So from the initial system identification, so when we're talking about, when ecologists talk about system identification, they may be talking about the boundaries of a lake or a forest. When an ethnobotanist talks about a system identification, we're talking about a social ecological system. So it's the people and the resources that they draw on. And so from identifying that system to identifying the terms that you're using, the, 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 the questions you're asking, the terms that you're using when you're describing these systems, to your baseline assessment of the system, so what's there, what are we trying to conserve, what are our conservation priorities? To the next stage is usually a, a stage of survey and monitoring, where you're doing a long-term study to look at how the system is changing over a year, over several years, and who's doing that monitoring and how, how that's done. Then to make predictions about that system. So when, when you're talking about moving into the step of applying knowledge and making recommendations for best practices, you need to know how that that system is going to respond to those changes. So if you decide that you're going to um, ban cutting of some type of grass, how will that system change? Well, the grass will get taller, but there may be some other effects of, as far as the diversity of the plants that are people that are using that, the people, um, the animals that are using that, fire regimes, etc. So when you're doing these, you have to be able to make predictions. And then how, do you, how does that, that information get coded into policy? Okay, which is a, a step that a lot of natural sciences don't ever take. Um, they don't, not that they never try to make that step, but they don't look at the process of doing that is from, from an integrated traditional society up the, up the ladder. <coughs> so how can the sociological, um, so from that first step, how can the sociological system, sociological, social, yeah, the socio-ecological system be defined locally? That's my how question, and then how, how does that change our understanding of community resource use? Before I actually, I'm still staying in the abstract a little bit, um, because I want to talk a little bit about collaboration and ethics. It's something I, I personally, um, believe very highly in, and when you're working in, in vulnerable communities, it's something very important. And there's a lot of um, paperwork that you usually have to gather in order to protect these vulnerable communities. And personally, I believe that they don't really protect the vulnerable communities, they protect the institutions that I work for. <coughs> Nevertheless, I gathered all of those signatures. Um, but in, and one of the things that participatory research teaches you, and forces you to do, but you still have to be cognizant of, is um, where true ethical standards happen is on the ground level. You have to uphold the ethical standards of the community that you're working with, in addition to your own. And so that only happens through a really integrated process and collaboration with the community that you're working with. And so for my research, I was working with young, um, with children um, as young as age eight or so, um, all the way up to women and, and elderly members of the community. And these, um, we had a research team that was comprised of not only local members of my community, but also scientists from, the, from, the, from Niger, 
and students from Niger, as well as land managers and um, conservation agents from Niger. And so they were at the really at the driving um, in the driver's seat for the research, and they were constantly giving me the checks and balances that I feel is necessary to protect the vulnerable communities. And so. Um, this I want to really stress from the beginning that this research could not have been done without them and that they're really the owners of, this, of all of this um, information. So I did not check which slide. This one can't really see a lot of my labels. But um, So I work in Niger in West Africa. We're now going to slowly move into um, the locality. From a global perspective, when you're talking about a socio-ecological system, they start usually telling you where you are on the map. And here is Niger. It's a sub-Saharan country. It is mostly Saharan country. Two-thirds of it is, is, is um, covered by the Sahara, Sahara Desert. Um, very, it's landlocked nation. It's very limited water resources, only one permanent river in the whole country. Um, it is uh, one of the largest countries, but a very small population because of the limited natural resources. And I think now it's been proven that they did not sell uranium to Iraq. Um, but where I work is actually a very interesting area. So it's right here where this, the one river meets this white section indicates the, the transition to um, the Savannah, Savannah uh, ecosystem. So it's the wettest part of Niger. And I put that in very strong quotes because most people who arrive there will still call it a desert. Um, but it does get more rainfall in the, in the times when it is raining than the rest of Niger. So you have both an increase in precipitation, water from precipitation, as well as a ge geographical um, water features in both the sense of this, the river, the, um, the Niger River that forms this W here, and you see that line moving down the middle of the screen. That's a former drop. Uh, riverbed, so it becomes it's a uh, floodplain. So you have these two geographical features intersecting at this area. So it's a very for as as, for Niche, as far as Niger goes, an area rich in natural resources, and it, it, um, as far as me as an ethnobotanist goes, um, an area that has a very high diversity of um, local high diversity of plants. So you have a lot of plants that are here that are nowhere else in the country. And for that, um, there is, this has been re recognized not only nationally and locally, but also internationally. So there is an, a national park, Park W, named after that little W in the river, um, that actually extends into Burkina Faso and Benin, which are the two countries you're seeing here bordered. And it houses one of the few West African populations of elephants. It houses um, some, some of our favorite um, uh, big predators like lions. Um, it does not house giraffes. Um, there are giraffes in Niger, but they're not there. Um, but it is, it is really important resource for a lot of wildlife. And a lot, it's been recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. So this is, um, this is why conservations are, conservationists are interested in this area. It's been in a national park since the 1950s. And then when you're talking about um, the town, the social ecological system, um, we're not talking about the park anymore because most of the people have been kicked out of there. Um, uh, so outside of the park, Boomba is the town that I work in. And again, we'll start talking about the political boundary, which is outlined here in white, and the settlements, which are these blue circles, these are where people actually live. Um, the rest of the area will be uh, either farmland or um, areas that they, they own. <coughs> And then um, the next thing they talk about is the ethnic groups that are represented. So globally, when you're talking about these, you generally refer to ethnic groups. And the major majority ethnic group that's represented here by this woman selling leaves is the, um, is the Zarma ethnicity. That's the language I speak. It's the majority of the residents and the historic owners of the land in this area. Um, there are strong uh, minorities of Fulani, which is um, this man sitting here in his half-built house, um, houses, which tend to be the fishermen in the area, and Maoris, which were historic hunters who had come down to the region to hunt um, large game. Most of them have changed professions at this point. In fact, he is um, 
a forestry agent, no longer a hunter. So that's it, actually in a museum. Um, and <coughs> they are predominantly subsistence farmers, millet farmers is the, the grain of choice. And um, depending on ethnicity, pastoralists and, and fishermen. I wanted to ask how people identify themselves and their own resource group. Where, where are their resources that they draw on? Who are the players who are involved in that resource? To do that, I did community mapping and stakeholder analysis. And um, I, uh, this means um, we had initial meetings with the town. We had it segregated by men and women, to, mainly to allow women um, the chance to speak. Um, not that they couldn't speak. Um, in group meetings, but they're much more free to speak when they um, when it's segregated. Um, and then ten, ten town hall style meetings where just everyone was invited. Um, and our first map that we got um, was one that looked like this. And um, this again, this is just drawn on paper. I was I digitized it afterwards. And to give you example from this is our original map. And to place that map, we, we, to integrate these two maps, we get this picture. So the first thing you'll notice is that the region has expanded dramatically. So it's bigger than their political boundaries. It's bigger than the land that they actually own because they draw on resources that are owned by other, other people, including the park. They've included the park, which is not, not actually an area that they are technically allowed to go to without um, assistance. But they see it as a resource even if they don't enter it, because it brings economic um, value to the area. As well as, it, you know, fish, it provides breeding grounds for fish that they will catch later down the river. So it was seen as a natural resource. Um, and then the, but, and the other, other thing is that they, you can't quite tell, but this is, they're, they're supposed to be three different kind of shading, so this is hatch marked, because they also talked about it as three different regions and um, if you look back on this map, you can see that the shading a little bit different because they did not talk about one set of resources that belong to the community, but the different types of resources and where they came from. So it was a much um, more heterogeneous map as well. When I asked who are the stakeholders in this, in the community resources, who are the people that um, are involved in both management and collection and use of community resources, natural resources? Traditionally, in ethnobotanical research, most research is done with elder healers because a lot of ethnobotanical research comes out of the medicinal background, so looking at uh, medicinal plants. And so they tend to work with elderly men. And that also, that, um, <coughs> that represents both an, the practical of needing to know, wanting to know about medicine, but also there is a theoretical um, backing behind that because the idea is that traditional knowledge is, is something that's acquired over a lifetime of learning. So the elderly members of the community <coughs> are going to be ones that are, are, have a greater amount of this knowledge. So you're going to get a better whole picture of resource use when you talk to the eldest members of a community. Um, and since the 70s, that has been very, there's been a, a push to re represent that equally gender wise because they've recognized that a lot of women are healers in, the, in, their, in their own right, even if they're not considered shaman or traditional healers, but they are the midwives and they deal with a lot of um, women's health issues separate from um, what male healers will do. And so they represent a whole separate segment of knowledge that you just are not going to get unless you treat both men and women equally and separately. Um, so this is what usually ethnobotanists ethnobotanists work with. When I talk to um, the community member, they definitely stress the importance of working with the elderly men and women. But they brought up two other demographic groups that were important resource users and managers. The first I title with um, a local name, Samaria, the local category. The best um, translation I can get for it is middle age. Um, but it really starts with marriage and ends when you become an elder. And so the age, age range is very different. It's different for men and women because men, women tend to marry younger. Um, and when you become an elder depends a lot about your family structure. 
so that that the end age range is very is variable and the beginning age range is variable. But they know who I'm talking about when I say Samaria. And they also talked about the youth, which is a group that tend, tend to be completely overlooked, um, partly because their knowledge is really hard to capture. And I will talk about that a little bit. But um, they said, you know, these, while youth can't really do anything, do much, I'm not going to tell you a lot of names of things, they're out working independently of their parents. They do a lot of the goat herding by themselves. They do a lot of collecting by themselves. And there are a lot, there's a big group of food plants that only kids will eat. So these are like snack food when you're out herding. Um, and like when I would eat them, people laughed at me. It was like, it was ridiculous. Um, and so there was a whole nother set of, super, of plant resources and natural resources that was being used and in some ways managed by the youth independent of elderly input. They also identified three ethnic groups. And I'm, um, so again, the, um, uh, they did not recognize the Maori as a separate ethnic group for the course of, um, of analysis. They integrated them with the houses, mainly because a lot of them have left the profession of hunting. But um, so they identified these three ethnic groups. So for the, looking at the question of how this changes the outcome, I did, um, I'm going to look at mostly those six demographic groups. I'm not, um, I rep included ethnicity as a, a variable, but not, I'm not analyzing that separately. <coughs> um, just for simplicity's sake, to all of a sudden multiply things. Um, so to do that, I looked at participatory quantitative analysis. So I was looking at, I'd say after about two years already of researching there to get an idea of ident identifying the terms, we came up with subsets of pictures that represented different types of natural resources, plant resources specifically. And um, we had people rank them, and we counted amounts of recognition. So how, how often, how many people? And I'm going to present mostly just the numbers for right now. And um, so again, we're, remember, most people deal with only the elderly, elderly communities of um, eldest members of the community. And so my question was, what are we changing when we're now including all six dem demographic groups? And the first thing that sticks out is this one. So when we're talking about forage plants, these are plants that are either um, used in the field to feed animals um, or collected and brought back to feed animals. Um, the, highest, um, the highest group, so the highest amount of recognition happened among this middle age bracket, the Samaria men. So if I were to even ask the Samaria's parents, I would have gotten less information than when I was asking um, the Samaria, Samaria men. And so this whole idea that we're asking um, the, uh, only the elderly community, we've all already got a different sense of the community resource group, um, uh, resource use when we are including the six group because we've expanded the amount of things that we're recognizing as forage food. What's interesting is the majority of the herding is actually done by the youth group. But they actually did poorly on this thing. And that's where this whole idea of capturing youth knowledge is very difficult. Because while they'll tell you what, what can be eaten by a goat, they won't know the name of it. And that's something that I being able to name a plant by its local name is something that does increase the age. And so that's where this, this um, disconnect is hard. <laughs> Um, but what's also interesting here is that you really see what the importance of these, these local, the locally defined categories. In the youth, you don't see any difference in gender, right? And there's a major difference um, coming in the, in the middle age group. And what happens there is marriage. And this may be only separated, some of these may be only separated by something like five years a difference, maybe two years difference in some of my interviewees. But what happened is women are now no longer tending goats. They're no longer going into the fields to tend goats. And they're no longer responsible really for forage foods. So there's a major difference. So like their learning stops, or not stops, but it s slows down dramatically when they're no longer participating in that activity. And it, but the men continue. They're still m very much responsible for that. 
So the next thing you look at is um, the, in the medicinal group, this is where we, see, we do see a high, speak, high peak in the elderly group. So now this makes sense. If we are really only concerned about medicinal plants, it's, it makes sense to be interviewing mostly the elders, members of the community. Um, but what's also interesting is that we're not seeing a gradual increase in, in age. We're seeing a huge spike. And at least in my region, partly of that is to explain because some people point to this as being a loss of knowledge, so the kids are not learning as much as their the eldest members of communities. But I will also argue that to some extent this is also shows the local role of elders in healing. You are not responsible for that knowledge until you become an elderly member of the community. And people won't even uh, even if they've seen their grandmother use that herb, they won't claim that knowledge for themselves. Um, the only time we did see this gradual increase with age was among women in food plants. So here we saw this nice trend of a, a ladder step where it was literally significance went up in age and we got a separation from the men as well. And that was because women are involved in food processing their whole life. They start when they're young, alongside their male brothers and brothers, um, their siblings, and then they continue in marriage, where they become the main um, provider as well as um, curator. And then, even as elderly, even though they are no longer responsible for preparing the meal every day in most families, they're, they still provide for the procurement. I never took an elderly woman out in the field and she returned empty handed. Every woman I took out in the field came home with like all of her skirts stuffed with food um, because it was an opportunity. She was out, she was collecting, she would, you know, that's part of her responsibility. So what's, what does this mean? So again, the first we got, um, when, we, when we asked the community to define their own community, their own definition, we got a more nuanced and heterogeneous uh, and a larger definition, more inclusive definition of the community, and we got an, a larger and more nuanced understanding of how community resources are spent. So then we get into the next term. So when we're, when we're working in these um, areas, we have to have categories. So these ideas of the food plants or medicinal plants, this is a category of food, the local terms of the names of the plants, et cetera the difference of terms. And to do that, you need to have terms that both you as a, cat as a researcher and your community that you're working with understand. And so to give you an example, and I'm not going to go through all the data on this, in this example, but I want to give you an example on the, in the case of famine foods. And when I tell you as an audience what is a famine food, um, how many of you, you can raise your hands, just, um, how many of you can picture what that means? And that maybe not name something, but you have an idea what I'm talking about when I say famine food. Yes? Okay. Now, um, how many of you have experienced a famine? Okay. In the community that I work with, if you're over the age of 40, you've experienced a famine that reached across six different countries in West Africa and lasted over six years, um, where you saw over 60% of the livestock die on the side of the road. If you are over the age of 20, you've experienced something that at least made it to the headlines of CNN. If you are the over the age of five, you've made it through a season where your food from last year didn't reach the next year and you start, had to start gathering things from wild resources in order to make ends meet, okay? When I asked them this question, they, said, they looked at me like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, and I'm like, you know, they're like, the definition of famine is there is no food. So why is there a famine food? And literally, I went interview after interview expecting everyone to be like coming up with lists. Well, you know, you've, you've been through a season where you've run out. I knew every one of my women that I was interviewing had been through a, a year where their millet did not make it to the next harvest. Everyone. And... Every one of them looked at me like I was crazy. And then the other great example, answer I got, and then they're like, oh, you mean corn. Because that's what those Americans send us when there's famine. So 
so like, you know, this, this was the kind of, I'm like, no, that's actually not quite what I mean, but I guess I'll write that down because that's what you think. And so I really learned that, first of all, that's not a local category. It's just not a conceptualized in that way. People do not think of foods as famine foods. They think of foods as a vegetable. And there are vegetables that they like. And there are vegetables they don't like. Right? And there are vegetables that they use out of necessity, which that's where I would start defining famine foods as an outsider. Um, but they won't call that a famine food because if you don't have millet, eating a lot of vegetables just gives you the runs. Right? And so you need... The, to, there are different types of foods and you have you know, strategies for dealing with famine and you will draw on all of those resources. And th so to conceptualize it as just a famine food was just completely foreign to them. And so there was, I would learned very quickly that things were divided by their food class. And the other thing that in a lot of definition, when you look at Western definitions of famine food research, they were talk about foods that are used exclusively in the time of famine. And again, even some of the ones that, the resources where when I was like prying things out of them, come on, like stuff you don't like to eat that you gotta eat, like because you don't have anything else to eat. Um, even those they'll say, well, you know, Anza was like the number one thing that came up that like I was like, ah, oh, there is something. Okay, Anza, it's a plant, it's this berry, this tree. It's really bitter. It requires like washing a hundred times, whatever. But they're like, but then I had a woman. She's like, but we use it in times of not famine. My my friend just used it the other week, because if we don't, we won't know how to use it. And you know, and this, and so not only was this not a form of category, but a lot of times the using these global categories, these famine foods. Western perceptions of the ideas, it really masked the strategies that people use when actually experiencing some of these things. And this, you know, this is a very extreme example because it's, you know, a type of term that is defined by people who don't experience the, um, the event, right? Um, but this happens on everything, like, you know, uh, the name of a plant. That I had one plant that was, um, when it is in um, bush form, it received one name, and when it was in tree form, it was one name, a different name. And I, as a biologist, was like, well, they're the same plant. If you stopped cutting this one, you'd get this one. And they're like, no, they're different plants. Because this one gives us nuts, and this one gives us mats. And so a lot of these, when we don't ask the definition and really seek out those definitions where um, we lose the, what, the, what, how things are being used, re, used and counted and valued. So when we're, so that, and that comes important in this next step, which is look, getting that baseline assessment. When we're doing conservation, we need to know what the priorities of an area is. Where are the resources that we want to value? Where are they high, where's the diversity highest? which are the areas that are most threatened, et cetera. And so we did participatory, the, my first baseline assessment was working with the community using that regional, that map we drew. And I said, okay, where are the resources? Where are they most diverse? Where are they most structurally diverse? Where are they um, most threatened? Which div div resources are most threatened? And then following that, we did a year of vascular plant surveys where we looked at presence and diversity, structure of the habitat, and um, presence of regrowth. And when we compared the ranking system that we get from the community just telling, sitting us on a map in, in a span of a week, giving, g working through this and telling us all this information, and a year's worth of vascular plant sur surveys with a team of uh, researchers, we get basically the same information, local knowledge, it's a blunt tool. It's not going to give us a, a fine tooth list of all of the plants are everywhere. But when you need to know where, on every diversity measure that matched up, on every structure, structure measure matched up 100%, most diversity ma uh, measures matched. The only, um, when we compared it to diversity indices, which is a calculation to affect both the number of plants as well as the representation of the, um, 
equality of the representation of different, uh, of, um, different species. That's the only time we really saw a divergence. And honestly, that most, most Western trained scientists, it's some, it's a, it was more abstract we got that was where it was diverged. However, even and then, we got information that was important and still um, valuable to the research as far as the conservation priority. And what was really interesting is that where it did diverge, it was still very attuned to rea local realities and priorities. So for diversity, diversity of um, green plants was something that men and women predicted differently. Um, men predicted according to the um, according to the actual diversity scales. Women were predicted differently, but women go to different regions and collect different forbs. So even though they predicted two different things and there was no ab absolute correct answer, we got things that were very attuned to the local realities. And as far as getting that baseline assessment and knowing which areas are being, are have high diversity and which areas are of high value and high priority in regards to conservation, we got that information. And the, gen the, and the use of vascular plant surveys blurred a lot of those realities because we were counting weeds alongside of endemic plants. So, um, so it, was really, it was really interesting. Um, and then the next line is in survey and monitoring. And there's, this has been, this is where I've seen a lot of action and from the ecologist side um, in current, where they've tried to, um, wanting to employ local people to conduct um, survey and monitoring work. Because this is something that ha has to happen over a long term period. And when you're talking about very remote areas like Niger, getting a, a foreign researcher out there is a lot of money. And if you can have people on the ground who are doing that work um, on a constant basis, it's, it saves a lot of money and it makes a lot more sense. Um, however, again, the question is, what's the training that someone's going to need? Do they be up, need to be able to train in Western taxonomy? And that requires continually being updated on when species are changing and we're reclassifying species. Do they need to be able to know the Latin binomial? Or is it enough to be able to count in their folk taxonomy? Is that precise enough? And that's where we get, we asked how, um, so in this case I was looking mostly at how these two correlated. What is the result? The process is pretty well established. Um, so they were doing vascular plant surveys. I did vascular plant surveys with local ecological knowledge experts. They were doing the surveys in folk taxonomy and then alongside it I had people trained in Western taxonomy. And what was the difference? And I don't know how, um, how, ma how many ecologists are out there, but a Pearson's correlation of 0 .999, 0 .99 is like unheard of in most ecology. This, is, this means it's, so one is perfect. So we're very, very close to being perfect, very close to a one-to-one -one ratio. It's almost a 45-degree ratio. Now, it's not perfect. A little bit off, um, and the slope is going to tell you where um, you're going to have a little bit more diversity shown. In so you're going to be able to count. It's a little bit finer tuned, tuned count with Western taxonomy than with um, local folk taxonomy. So that means, especially among some of the weedy species, there are a lot of um, relatives which are separate species species, but they look the same, and they function the same, and they'd be given one name in folk taxonomy. Um, so that's where you're losing some of that precision. But it's really, really close, and as far as getting the bottom line, as far as counting units of diversity, we're still getting the same results when you put, run those through the things. And what was really interesting is when you did have divergences, that was actually where a lot of information, a wealth of information came. So it was usually on one end of the spectrum. Either the plant was really, really valuable to the community, so it, it warranted more than one name, like the, the bush versus this tree. So it would be counted twice in a folk taxonomic count, whereas an ecologist would only count it as one unit of diversity if both were present, um, whereas a folk taxonomist would have counted it twice. Um, or it was at the other end of the species where they were of so little value they didn't really warrant a name. 
in the so they were just called oh just somebody's cousin meaning like a plant we use is his cousin that we don't use and so these this kind of information told us information about the plant's like history how it told us information about how long it had been present we had some plants where it was a weedy species where up the hill people called it one thing and down the hill they called it differently and so how many so most likely that plant came in after those people started living up the hill and down the hill right like this was once a community they moved downwards at in about the 1950s after or actually a little bit later when the, the um, river got dammed and they had been living together and if they were all living together you would think they would have named that plant all the same thing so these you know all of this information only came about because we had this partnered so not only that we had folk taxonomists work working but that we had also people trained in science in Western science alongside them <clears throat> so then how does um, the local knowledge contribute to predictions of research regeneration so here we get back to these this diversified landscape so let me tell you a little bit about the plateau region which is an upland region is used mostly for wood harvest and pastoralism the Baboy region is a lowland region that is predominantly agriculture fields um, there's some wild resource guard um, gathering specifically for shea if you, anybody's used shea butter this is one of the hot spots for shea butter pr production in here um, and some animal husbandry as well and then across of course is the park which is managed mostly through um, the use of fire there's no active management as far as um, culling or, or, or curing in this area um, but they do early fire application um, so the, um, the methods I was looking at, so there's a major deforestation narrative that's in West Africa. So basically that the Sahara is expand, expanding. And since about the turn of the century, that has been explained because they, um, early scientists believe that this was once, um, the whole Africa was once basically Rome's um, farmland. And through mismanagement and the poor use of fire, we've had this increasing desertification. And that science has been disputed, but that narrative is still there in a lot, especially in West Africa, even more than in Western science. Right? So it's still present that, that basically, if we don't, um, that, that it's poor land management. Um, number one things you'll see is fire. Number two, overabundance of harvest of wood for wood fires and um, number three is just poor agricultural practices so we wanted to kind of test this so how is this this changing where are we seeing deforestation in our area are we seeing regrowth and so one of our first things we see we looked at the number of seedlings in the areas that we had and the area of highest wood production this is place the highest wood where they are harvesting so this is again this deforestation a lot of NGOs are coming in to try to get plant woodlots with foreign trees so people don't harvest the native trees. People are trying to give them improved cook stoves. They don't use as much co wood cooking. And this is like the major source of wood for this whole village and the village on the other side. And it has the highest amount of regrowth, much higher than in the park. It's much more densely populated for wood and it's much, much more, more higher regrowth. And we saw it in every size class. So it means it's uh, the big thing you, you see for a size class is you want to know that they're not only getting seedlings on the ground, but you're getting uh, growth up the chart, right? So why is that? Because normal production of har harvest of wood only harvests dead wood. So it actually thins and allows for seedlings to grow very well. Um, the only difference is when you get clear cutting for fields, then we would tell a different story, right? And Boomba, where it is mostly field production, you do have a much, much lower. But even then, um, we'll look at, when we looked at high value species, so these are 10 species that was by the community said, these are species we want to protect. These are very important to us. Some of them were doing well, and some of them were not doing well. Um, and they recognized that. They would tell me, this species we have not seen a young tree in for 25 years. 
this species we have not seen a young tree in for 30 years. Um, and they will tell you, and the old, and, or this species, we haven't seen a young tree, and the old trees are dying. So there's, you know, they'll tell, tell us this, what, what is doing well, what is doing, and these were the species. When we looked at that, the areas where we saw them, by far, were in the highly intensely used, managed, locally managed areas. This is where we saw the presence of these species, as well as the regrowth of these species, as well as seedlings of these species. So it wasn't a factor of, okay, the, the farms were incompatible with these presence of these species. Farms were incompatible with a dense forest. But farms were not incompatible with simply the presence of a valuable species, which is, is like, and it's a, this A. digitata, that's the baobab tree. And it, it reco it's, there's a lot of research on this tree because it, people see this as a, as a threatened species. Personally, in my area, I don't think this will become threatened until you kill off all the people. Because people, well, I should say this, till you kill off all the women. Because women love the species. They will plant it, they will plant forests of it, they will plant plantations of it, they will guard it, they will put kids out to guard it. And if it's not growing, there's something else going on. And I've personally seen plantations that are only 20 years old um, that people have planted. That, and a lot of the reason this it hasn't been a focus of, is because people work only with men. Because to men, the wood is not useful, so it's not very useful. Even though they eat baobab every single day, right? But they don't have to cook it or collect it. So this is, um, so there was, there's a nuanced approach, and, there, and they have also claimed that, you know, since, basically since that great famine in the 70s, they've been a, a rainfall deficit. Rainy seasons have become shorter, and rainfall has decreased. And they're like, that's why, especially the baobab, um, the A. genitata is the baobab, the B. ethiopium is the, um, no, no, V. paradoxa, sorry, is the shea butter tree. They're like, that's why we're not getting any young shea butter trees. It requires a long rainy season, and we've had 30 years of short rainy seasons. So we haven't seen a young tree make it for 30 years. And they've been doing plantations of this because it's a major economic growth, and, they've been, and it's not, they're not surviving out in the wild. And so people there, they're saying, no, this is because of this change in the climate. So how does this affect policy? So how is this local knowledge then coming into the policy? And to answer this question, I looked historically to see at national policy, and I looked at the example of fire policy. This is something mainly because I could, with fire policy, I could see where, who is informing the policy. Because lo Western knowledge up until the last 25 years and local knowledge was very different on the, as far as the use of fire in, in, um, <coughs> in forest ecosystems or savanna ecosystems. And so I looked at fire and I looked from the local history through the archives through and doing interviews to about about 150 years ago, or 100 years ago for interviews, 150 years ago um, <coughs> uh, for the policy work. And um, so I looked at these three different eras. And then the first area is the colonial land mass. This is a French colony. Um, when you saw the start of the French colony, um, you saw the start of a forest service, a unified forest service. Um, there was immediately, pretty, pretty soon after the, um, the Forest Service, there was a um, fire ban. So no, before that, local people were um, using fire to control the bush, and um, you did a f um, that was prohibited completely. All fire, use of fire in the bush was prohibited. Um, <coughs> and then um, there was also a lot of research starting to be done, mostly by French scientists in West Africa. And then they started seeing the value of early fire as a necessary evil. So they, when you apply early fire, meaning you apply fire right at the end of the late of the rainy season when everything's still green, you can you get a very cool fire because it's not going to get really hot because the vegetation is still wet, um, and it burns off the brush, the grasslands, the grass in between the trees, and prevents later season fires that might start accidentally or by people from taking down trees, okay? 
So they start, so the French scientists started recognizing it. And so then they came back in 1955, about 20, 20 years later, and started a fire early prevention, a early fire policy. And this was done by local people. Local people were allowed to form committees and manage their bush as they saw fit use, using the early fire. Then came the Great Sahel. So the next era, so independence was in the 60s, right? We really didn't see a change in policy with independence. We saw a huge change in policy when the famine hit. Because now all of this idea, these narratives was validated. Because this, this great famine was uh, justified, or the reason why this happened, um, was the narrative at the time, was because of, again, poor mismanagement, bad use of fire, poor agricultural processes. The area got flooded by researchers, not only from French, so now, because now it's an independent colony. It's not just French scientists coming in all over the world. A lot of American scientists. This is the first time, really, American scientists started going to, um, to Africa in large num numbers, especially former colonies. Um, and you had a, also a lot of research being done on this area. So you got an, another, in 1974, right at the end of this, another fire ban. So now, again, the rights were taken back away. And this was a flat out ban. You cannot use fire outside of the park where it was still used as by employed by forestry agents only, but it's still used as a management tool. But people outside the park weren't allowed to use it as a management tool. And in Niger, you also saw a change in the, um, the, land, the political landscape because it went under military rule. And this was a, the time people talk about in interviews when things got done. Um, like there was a lot of uh, reforestation campaigns. There was a lot of um, wood lots that started in this era, um, tree planties. There was just a lot of discourse. And because it was under military rule, if um, Kunche wanted it to happen, it happened. But what's interesting, so I have this picture here of these guys standing on these logs right here. That's my, um, my guard de foray, the forestry agent, um, his assistant, and one of the students that worked with me. Um, these logs are harvested from a wood lot that was planted during Kunche's time, but you still can't harvest those lots. So they, the people of Vumba planted them alongside, um, under basically order of the government, um, but they are, and they're planted on their land, but they are owned by the forestry agent. They cannot harvest that wood or even the fruits of the tree without permission. They still harvest the fruits of the tree, but, um, but they won't harvest the wood without permission. They get in big trouble for that. Um, so, although a lot of stuff got done, no ownership was transferred to local individuals. To the state, yes. So that was making progress. We're not, we're no longer being, it's no longer being controlled by France, but not by local individuals, not by landowners. <coughs> um, but what's interesting of this era, with all those scientists, you really started seeing the discourse of science also changing, and this really led to what's happening now, which is where you start seeing local knowledge being reinvigorated. So in the conventional biological diversity, which is one of the major, first major global biodiversity um, ecological laws, right, like conventions right, that the US didn't sign, um, they mention traditional knowledge. They don't mention rights of indigenous knowledge holders, but they do mention the preservation of local ecological knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge, which is a major step first environmental and that they actually recognize this as, as um, important knowledge to preserve. In Niger, a similar um, echo was in the Code Real, which was a, a set of codes to preserve local land rights, okay, and traditional um, land management. They still don't get fire back. They're still not allowed to use fire. At, but the Code Real allows them to use fire to clear their field which is, again, another step. They recognize that that's an important part of fire management to clear their field. But it's not allowed to um, use it in the bush settings around the village. Um, and in Niger, also, you get back to dem democratic rule and a process of de decentralization where local governments are given more, um, more authority. That has changed a little bit in the last two years because there's been some political turmoil. And I, I'm not completely up to date on the political scene. But this trend is still, still there. So what did we have happening? First, the first era, local knowledge was basically ignored or exploited. People would be used as guides 
and then their own their work would be cited by the French scientists, but no credit was given to them at all. Um, Western science was the only tool for validating policy. Um, here we get state actors, so Nigerian independent state actors. They became validated also through Western act knowledge. So a forestry agent only became a forestry agent, not because he could prove he knew all the trees in the forest, but because he proved he went to a French school. Right? And what was interesting in that area, there was a process of what's affectation. So in order to prohibit com um, corruption, people would be sent to regions where they didn't grow up, meaning your local knowledge was, was therefore useless. Because you know, now you have a guy who grew up under shade trees, and he's working in the desert where there are no shade trees. Um, and so it was not, um, so local actors were, um, they were exploited and they were used, but not engaged, right? So for planting, for example, like they were used for mass labor, but not given ownership over the trees. Now we see this flip, and it's really interesting, where we're seeing local knowledge is being used to validate foreign actors. There is not a conservation program that does not come through Bumba, that does not have a meeting like the meeting that I, that I described at the beginning of the talk, where you have these town hall meetings, and you have a scene like this. I don't know if you can see, but you have four people, one foreigner, um, two city, or three city um, Nigerians sitting in very nice dress in chairs, and the village villagers all sitting around them, um, and they bring them food, and, and we're talking about what's going to happen. And you basically can't have a program without that. Whether that actually does anything is another question. Um, the state actors are still distinguished by their West, Western knowledge. The process of affectation, sending people to another area, is, is still, is still um, valid. However, you're starting to get the recognition of local knowledge. Right? Like, local knowledge is still considered valuable. What we're not getting, so we're, and is local people who have been able to use local knowledge to gain power. So what we haven't get, gotten is where local knowledge is allowing local people to set local policy. That step hasn't come yet. Um, because there's still this overwhelming narrative that, that um, the, the result, the environmental problems are a result of mismanagement. So those are the pieces of the pie. And where does this come, bring us back to our original questions of what um, participatory research does? And we saw it, is, it provides a really great set of tools, both for the ecologists and giving them a lot of different new information about the eco ecological system, as well as the anthropologists giving them new information about the, the social system. How do these tell the stories? They can actually tell the same story. However, they do often yield two different yet valid stories. Almost every time when divergences happened, explanations for both happened. And it made sense. And together, you actually got a better story. <coughs> um, and what's really important is participatory <coughs> research offers a way to engage local people, not just their knowledge. So when done right, it really does involve people in an ownership way. And it's a first important first step for policy formation. But it really won't be solidified until you get um, some power transfer. You've seen that, we've seen that happen in participatory research in a lot of, um, in Western societies, where you're working with um, uh, environmental justice issues, where people have used participatory research methods to champion environment justice um, causes in inner city Boston, for example, to try to get um, the salt uh, trucks to be able to cover, um, cover their salt so they're not running salt into a poor neighborhood, right? Um, that was very briefly explained, I don't know if that was good. But um, so in Chelsea, in a, in a neighborhood, a poor, poor neighborhood in Boston, there's that stores 90% of the salt used for the state of Massachusetts, road salt. It stores it in or open containers. And they're using participatory research to try to show that this, this is an environmental hazard for the community that lives around it. And, they need, and federal laws require that it be covered, but they are given exemptions because it would be an economic bird hardship. Never mind the fact they're also right on the estuary. But. 
um, that this is where, you know, so we've seen that happen in Western societies, and then it, but it's much harder to work that when you have a multitude of cultures working in the area, you have vulnerable people who are not used to getting, getting their rights. Um, so with that, I'll open it for questions. And um, well, actually, I'll first thank all of the people that provided this um, help and support in this work. It was funded by NSF, National Science Foundation, as well as the Switzer Foundation, and a bunch of other things. Um, but those were the two big ones. And I think I had um, over, over 150 participants in, on the interview level. I had a really hardworking team um, per pictured here that went out and did vascular, per, for, uh, uh, vascular plant surveys in all three of those regions every month for three years. Um, and really, really hardworking, including um, I had a couple students from the university and one very city girl who was not into going into the bush. Um, so a lot of sacrifice, personal sacrifice and, and time as well from a lot of people to make this research. That's the end. Any questions? Based on their history line, um, they were there since the 1500s. Um, so, so yes, in some ways they were colonists. Um, and that's why I, I, especially I use the term local um, ecological knowledge because in Africa that's a really, indigenous knowledge is a really touchy subject because um, people have been in Africa for a long time. And so who was there first is a really hard question to ask. It's not like the Americas where the, where you saw groups come in. You know, people evolved in Africa. And so um, there have been migrations and changes. Um, but 1,500, I mean, it's 500 years of, um, you know, they can trace, at least for this village, they have 500 years of chiefdom in this village. Um, and they came from areas, they followed a river down, so the river down, so, and they probably f did that with a changing of climate, so um, they probably came from an area that was um, uh, similarly um, climatically. Um, so, yes, I mean, it does change how people use it, and it's, and some of the people I'm working with, I mean, that's, the other, the other thing with indigenousness is women, most women have only been there for as long as their marriage, right? Unless they're youth and they've been born. And so um, they're also coming to areas new, sometimes from different, sometimes from completely different areas of the country, sometimes from just the town over. Sometimes they're married within the village, but um, the, the culture is that you go where the husband is. So um, they they do have I mean they have a they have many generations of experience with that um, and they have seen the the I mean I interviewed one person that has at least personally a hundred years of experience in the area um, but I I think it's hard to really tell exactly how that's changing I mean the one thing I didn't get into. What is change? I feel like is more um, relevant is the way the climate is changing now, and the economics are changing now. Is means what I'm looking at today, even 30 years ago, is very different. So that peak with like forage foods, for example, a peak of knowledge by the young people, may be actually an indication of the fact that animal husbandry is so much more important to to farmers nowadays. So because people are having to diversify, because farms are, are failing, and people are having to diversify their income strand. Um, and so, 
you know, so there's a changing in economics that I think is much more relevant to um, the, how we perceive this ecological knowledge. Um, but that I think only really gets uncovered with time and with uh, intense engagement in the way. I will go back to you. I was wondering, um, but is there, you know, poaching going on inside the park or like illegal logging or anything like that? Maybe not by these populations, but just in general. Um, what I know is going on is illegal grazing. That's pretty, pretty, like pretty well known um, and pretty common. Um, I even had like one time um, my. I have always have a forestry agent with me, and a lot of times it's just a chef of the forestry agent. And he was like, Jocelyn, actually call me Safi, that's my local name. Um, Safi, he's like, we gotta get out of here. He's like, because there are people grazing over there, and if I see them, I have to find them. And they had just had like a really, like actually a, an agent get macheted trying to, um, and lose an eye over um, trying to enforce anti-poaching. And, um, <clears throat> Um, if I see them, I will have to find them. And if they know I'm here, then I become a laughing stock, right? Like, so he'll lose a lot of his authority if they know that he's within that close and didn't find them. And so it's like this balance of, of things. So poach, uh, poaching less so. Um, I hear it goes on, like I see, but it's really not extensive. I mean, it's not the way you don't see, bush, at least not in Niger. I don't know, um, actually Daphne might be able to tell a little bit more about on the other side of the the um, the park on the in Burkina and Benin, but you don't see bushmeat coming into the market very much at all. Like you don't see um, trade of, I mean like the, when you do have medicine men coming around with like monkey hands, you can tell they're like, I mean, like they've been passed down. Like it's really pretty, pretty rel um, low scale. But the effect of, poach of grazing is still big, and the effect of fire setting. People set fires. They've been able to say that, that is big, but that shouldn't threaten the um, the regrowth of trees. Um, and you know, I had so people were farming that land 50 years ago in the park. Um, it was it was a field. They were kicked off. The villages were burned to kick them out. Um, and you can still see those farms, the imprint of those farms 50 years ago. They still have the same agricultural weeds co covering it, and there hasn't been a major regrowth in the trees. Because, I mean, 50 years ago, they were kicked off, and then 30 years ago, you had the increase of the, um, or you, had, you started seeing climate effects. So 20 years isn't a lot for a tree to gr grow back a forest if you already have like a cleared land so the, the habitat there is very, like, it's, I mean, it's still doing great. And I wouldn't say that it's, like, it's not regenerating at all. Um, but you're not getting, like, a dense forest coming in. You still have a very open savanna landscape. And there's a big theory in, counter theory to a lot of that um, deforestation is that this savanna landscape is preserved not only through fire, but also through the protection of trees on people's farmland because people want those trees. They're very, very valuable. And you don't see a settlement. I mean, there's a lot of um, tree planting campaigns, but there is not a settlement in Niger that doesn't have a tree in it. And now they mostly have neem trees because that was the tree promoted. But historically, they had fig trees. And now fig trees are dying because neem trees are taking their ecological niche, which is as the founding of villages. And I mean, there are fig trees that are considered that is how you found a village, is you bring a fig tree with you. So people planted trees 500 years ago. There is a fig tree in the and that founded the village, and that's, you know, that's 500 years ago. So, um, you know, so there's, it's, it's not a matter of, I mean, there's also a big population expansion, so that's another big thing that is, it needs to be counted. So it's not saying that, that like none of the management was perfect, but it's 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 kind of just putting a different perspective that there are there are local managements that address <coughs> the same issues that scientists are trying to address that fit within the local culture, that fit within the local ecosystem. 
and provide a lot of really good you know, side benefits that if we can engage the population and give them ownership rights, they'll, they'll participate. about the trees. So the new trees, they are indigenous and not exotic? No, they're exotic. They're exotic, okay. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of your fire policy, now there is scholarship that actually says fire is not a bad thing oh. for an ecosystem, right. but from your, um, and I could be wrong, but from your presentation, it seems like you're saying that there is a problem with fire and there needs to be policy but how do the locals actually perceive that? Because if they, you say you interviewed someone who's lived there for about 100 years, um, in terms of their view about the fire and forest and regeneration, et cetera. So that, that was just the one question. Um, your community, you spoke about it being very heterogeneous. Um, I wanted to know what the class differentiation is because that also affects the way people use resources and interact like, with nature and their understanding of the local ecological system. So um, political economists would say that they were you know, poor peasant farmers, rich media, et cetera. And I just wanted to know how that played out in your research. Okay. Um, so first on the fire policy. Um, I will say the, the perspective of fire as bad is a narrative that's come out of um, um, old French science, like from turn of the century French scientists. They perceived fire as being one of the major causes of the desertification. That has been challenged, and most people nowadays see that fire, in some ecosystems, there's a difference between um, where most French people did their research, which is in France, and savanna and fire uh, ecosystems. And <coughs> to get a savanna, you have to have fire. Um, to keep that fire, that tree grass ratio, you have to have some fire. And you, most people will say that you have to have a patchwork of fire. So early fire is an important tool for managing cool fire, but occasionally you have to have hot fires too, and if they can be controlled. And that's where, um, a lot of people argue that the old allowing communities to do it um, gives you that natural patchwork because they're not going to be organized across a nation, right? Like they're they're going to be organized within their community, but they're not going to consult with the neighboring village. When are you guys setting your fires? So you're going to get a more of a patchwork. Um, that is hard is hard to test, but um, a definitely patchwork system is is been validated in Western science. Um, but that still that narrative per, per, pers persists, and so it's still reflected in that policy. So the policy still reflects a fire as bad or a necessary evil. Is that's what the um, Arborville is one of the early French scientists who he was like kind of the reason why they had the fire ban in '35, and then they had an early ban, a early fire policy in '55 because he was like, oh well, he started doing research in Cote d'Ivoire and said, oh, well, actually, it's a necessary evil. You've got to have these early fires to keep the ba big bad fires from coming. Um, and so they've been using it as early fire. But um, nowadays, people think it's, it's a little even more heterogeneous than that, um, that it should actually be a patchwork of fire um, policy. But um, And the landowners, for the most part, they you know they'll tell you, well, we're not allowed to do our fires, you know, and they'll just do the ones they absolutely find necessary, like clearing the field. Although that's been like since the 90s is now actually allowed, but um, they'll do that anyways, and they've been doing it for even since it was banned because they're like, whatever, I have to have millet, you know, come arrest me, that's fine, but if I don't have millet, I'm worse off. Um, but um, so they'll do those kind of fires, but. Um, the community where they used, they said they used to go out and burn um, the countryside around the village to keep um, in, in like community action committees. They, um, that's been totally stopped. However, what's changed is there's a lot more farms. So to some extent, it's a lot less necessary now outside of the park um, because there are a lot less farms. And they'll say some of the, the pastoralists will revolt if they actually did it anymore because there's so many more farms 
there's a lot less forage areas and they need, even though fire pr promotes a second growth of forage, and that's why there's a lot of um, pastoralism and fire setting in the park that's done illegally, um, is because they're, promote, they're setting fires to promote that second flush of forage and so that they can get the forage. And, and some would argue that that's good for the park because the forestry agents, they're not, they're not able to cover the whole park. Like they really can't, and you are getting, again, that patchwork by allowing or turning a blind eye to illegal fires or not being able to enforce the ban of illegal fires. They're not really causing major damage in the park. They're not doing anything more than what the forestry agents themselves are doing. But the problem is, is it's not allowed. Right. And it should be controlled. Um, so that's, that's where that, it, this disconnect comes. As far as class differences, in the village, um, the big class differences come between the forestry agent and um, the, the community members. There are some distinctions, you know, of course, the chef, the, the, the village chief versus, um, but you're still, the village chief is still a millet farmer. You know, he's not, um, majority of his income comes from millet. So I would still, even though he does have some distinctions and um, politically it's a, you know, you have to navigate that area. Um, I wouldn't say it has a major effect on resource use. What has a major effect is the city and the people that come from the city and then people who come from, you know, further points to the city, right? Like from who the city is an airport to them, right? So um, <coughs> that's where you have major distinctions. That's where some people get chairs and some people don't. Um, you know, they only have four chairs in the village. So that's, you know, those are the kinds, of, those are the distinctions. And that does have effects on community resources. I mean, it's ridiculous. The, the park is starting, they're trying to do this ecotourism, and they've started a settlement, um, or not a settlement, a campground. And this campground has better houses than most of the people live in, right? And they're still thatch roofs, but they have like cement floors and like things like that. But they don't have the money to upkeep it. And honestly, most nowadays, most Westerners, if you say campground, they're fine with a bare patch of soil and you tell them where, you know, but, um, so it's, and, but it's this dynamic, it's this class dynamic. They know the people who will be using the campground will be of a different class than themselves. And so it has to be at higher ma maintenance and, and it's, it's a real burden for the community to maintain it. Um, and they're supposed to be able to maintain it on the profits of the campground, but they don't get that many tourists to really be able to do that. And so that's where you, you see some of those issues. Any other questions? I know you had more questions, but you, yeah, go ahead. Hmm? Right. <laughs> it's much better than it was this morning. <laughs> For agriculture, for millet seed, so there's a lot. There's Inran is a big um, agricultural research organization, and they occasionally come through and provide um, improved seeds. I mean, millet is not a major focal cr crop for agricultural resource research, um, so there isn't a lot of like Monsanto doesn't own that many patents over it, right? Um, but that's exactly why INRAN is around. Like INRAN is trying to focus on, um, it's an organization that's trying to focus on crops that are valuable to people who actually need improved seeds um, for, you know, kind of greenness. So they do, um, and I know people with, who have mixed opinions about that. Like they'll be like, yeah, we get these seeds, you know, these, these, like blah, 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 blah. these white people, they come in, they give us free seeds, and you think you would, we take them? Because we think this white guy just came in, he gave me a free seed, he must be great. He's like, and then we plant them, and they come up, and their stalks, like a millet stalk's normally like this big, and their stalks like this. And I'm like, and now I'm hungry <laughs> because my stalks are no longer this big, but they're this big. 
because they've been improved for, you know, whatever, like different things. Um, so there's mixed opinions about that. Most people will plant them to some extent. Um, still, the majority of millet that's planted is seed saved um, and things like that. As far as um, cash cropping, the, that usually happens in things like um, trees. So one of the big things was they did a gum Arabic um, plantation, it, at least in my region. There are some areas that tobacco is a big deal, but um, in my region, um, that's not that big of a deal. But um, um, so they did this big gum Arabic, which that again was most local people were like, well, we did it because they paid us to do it. But it's ridiculous because in my, so gum Arabic is, um, it's produced by an acacia tree, it's an acacia variety, and um, it produces this gum, which is used in Coca-Cola, it's a thickener, it's a flavorless thickener, it can be used in a lot of um, candies, um, whatever, and there's a big increase in price because there's been a dropout in one of the other major sources that went under war in West Africa. I don't remember where, but still relevant. So there are major increases of price um, because they've lost a big supply chain. So they're like, okay, everybody's got to plant this. Well, it produces it because it's a drought res re uh, resistance. Well, I told you my area is one of the few areas in Niger that actually gets a decent amount of rain. So it doesn't produce gum Arabic in my area, but they, everybody's got to do it. This is a national policy, and people are paid to do it, and forestry agents are enforced to do it. So they, they didn't plant a, and they're like, and this stuff, it attracts birds, so that they come and eat my millet crop. And, you know, they're like, and we have no benefits from this. Now, yeah, they had to water them. They had to do all this stuff. And, and it's pretty, I mean, it's better than the eucalyptus because that uh, was a big one. Bef like 25 years ago, they again, with woodlots, they were planting eucalyptus. And that actually kills the millet next year and dro drops your water table by about 10, 15 feet, which when you have, like, water issues, dropping your water table is a big deal. Um, and when you're pulling it all by hand, dropping your water table is a big deal. Um, so that people are now, like, they're pulling it out and like burning the stump to try to get rid of it because it like you cut it down it will grow back so they have to like they have to like take major actions to get and they're like whoever thought of this person you know and and this is all coming because people didn't ask what plant would you like to plant if you want to get the people money to plant trees ask them what tree you'll plant and they'll tell you like give women money to plant baobab trees they'll plant them they'll plant them for free if you just give them seeds you know and um, that's it was something actually one of my colleagues really worked with. Um, the I pointed out at the very end, Eero, he just got his PhD, by the way. Um, the guy in the baseball hat over here, he's from he's Nigerian, not from this region, from an uh, other region, and that's one of his like number one like goals in his like academic research is that if you ask people what trees they want to plant, they'll plant them for free. You know, and it's like there's all this this kind of research, or like kind of institutional um, inertia, like where just people, you know, I can't do it. Forestry agents, there's so many forestry agents tell me I can't do anything because I have no money. And it's like, but you have access to resources that the people, that community members here don't. You can go into the park and collect seeds for plant, plants that have disappeared on this side, or one of the big plants that. Um, the one of the things that is harvested a lot illegally is, um, I have a quick picture of it, is a, 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 for, um, it's a tree that they eat the leaves with edible leaves. And then the traditional population of it was on the other side of the park. And it's always been there. That's where it was. And people don't keep it in their fields because men don't like it because it serves no purpose other than provide food. Women would love to get seeds of this thing. But... It's hard to get um, the, the, they're hard to get. Um, some people harvest it illegally, but the time when the seed is a hard time to enter the park. So it's really hard to get seeds of this plant. And so definitely, and, and men are starting to recognize right now that it's completely disappeared from this side of the park. They'll plant it in their gardens, right? Like they won't plant it in their fields, but they'll plant it in their gardens. And women will plant it in areas that they tend. So. Again, they have those resources. They could get access to that, but 
like when you talk about planting trees, there's this whole um, talk about it needs to require money. And most of that is because you're forcing people to plant stuff they don't want to plant. Um, and um, for the most part, the farmer who the tree is, the, if the tree is in a field, the farmer owns that tree. Um, there are some communal places um, where people could harvest. And, you know, if that farmer is a cousin of yours, you know you can harvest there, which, I mean, half the people are cousins. Um, so it's not, I mean, the only, the real trees, they really send kids out. I mean, there are a couple trees that they send kids out to really watch. Those are like mango trees. They like literally have children sleep underneath the mango tree to keep people from stealing their mangoes. Um, baobab, to some extent, the only really valuable ones um, for the most part. But there's, you know, kind of communal law that, that prevents. And, that, and that's where these kind of codification, this whole traditional law, because you know – you know this is not your tree, you're not gonna harvest it, so that limits the number of harvests. So you don't usually get a lot of damage from the harvest. Um, but as soon as you block all access, then you have, like so there's a park, like I can't tell you how those trees are doing because that's all illegal harvest and there's no ownership anymore. The co local laws are not applying anymore because everything's illegal. So who knows if that's actually benefiting those trees or not. I mean, they're there, but they wouldn't have been cut down anyway. So it's, I mean, it's a national park just the way, like, Yosemite is. It's set up in, like, the, in, set up in the Yellowstone model of parks. You have to pay entrance to get in. Most people who are come in as tourists are foreigners. Um, uh, the entrance fees are less for local residents, um, but it's still prohibitively expensive. I mean, most of the people I took in there because of my research had never been in there since, like, especially the women. Like, the women I took in there hadn't been in there for 50 years since they'd been, the villages had been burned. Um, and, um, you know, and some never because they're, they're under 50 years old. Um, <coughs> and, but they still see it as a resource because there are, is stuff that comes. The people who do end, so I don't know if I have a picture of it. Um, let's see if I can get get to it. But um, if you see on the map, um, there's a community across the way, across the river that's actually in Benin. They tend to use it a little bit more um, because of where are those cars? Um, because um, they can get access to it illegally. Um, so I don't know if you can see this, but um, do you see how this, there's a river, <laughs> uh, um, there's a river that, that it, here. Um, so this is the Mekru, it's a feeder river to this is the River Niger, this is the Mekru. And there is a settlement um, here, basically. And so the forestry agents are located here. They can see what's happening here. Like, so for Boomba, people going across the river is really hard because you know you're taking a boat. For these people, they can sneak across here and it's h really hard for them to patrol. And so that's where like illegal, har like for women who enter, they're only women from this area. Um, uh, and pastoralists who enter will also kind of enter from these back areas. Um, although I did see one, well, even then, though, like, I saw them once crossing the Niger with their, go their cows. Amazing. Cows swim. Um, but yeah, so they're herding across this river by swimming beside them and yelling. Um, anyways, but they enter and exit through this legal area and then sneak in. 
So that's, that's who, but, and then the forestry, but they still, even those people who don't enter the park on the boom bus ride, they still see um, benefits. I mean, the amount of NGOs that come through, they come through, they know, they come through. They're like, they're like, you're only here because of the park. I did my research, my Peace Corps was 15K down the road. The reason I did my research there was because of the park. You know, and they know that. They recognize that value. So. Yeah, that's not true in Africa. That's like blatantly not true in Africa. Like most African parks, I mean, this, this area right here was a village farmed. And people, this, the site of the, where people gather that, that one is right here. And that's been harvested for 100 years. That's been the site for harvest for that plant for 100 years. Um, and just now they do it illegally. Um, and the African... African park history um, is very, I mean, like there in a lot of East African parks, there's even evidence that it was, they were created not only to kick people off the land, or not only to create the park, and therefore they kick people off the land, but they were actually created to kick people off the land because um, they, uh, colonial farmers were having trouble getting wage laborers. Because as long as somebody has a farm, they're going to work for themselves. You know, if someone is a farmer and they have a place to farm, even if you've taken all of the good farmland for colonial settlement, I'll go to a bad farm land, and I'm I'm still better off working for myself on a bad piece of land than I am working for somebody else for pennies. And so they were having trouble. And so a lot of the, at least in the East African, I mean, they have actual documentation that that was part of the argument that went in to creating the park system was to dislocate people from their land. Um, here, I, I don't know that they have that, that, that dimension because French colon, colon, um, colonies were very different than English colonies. Um, but nevertheless, people were come. I mean, they have stories um, of, you know, basically they were told your village will be burned next week and it was burned. Um, and then they were kicked off the land. And um, there are settlements in, in boom. This settlement right here is descendants of people who used to live here. Um, so there was a major migration of people. Some people went to Boomba. Some people went um, down to Benin or across to Burkina. Um, and um, some people decided to stay. And they founded that small village. And, I mean, a lot of the guys in the in the entry point to the park. So this isn't the main entry point to the park. The main entry point to the park is um, further, like south, directly south of Niamey. That is populated mostly by descendants of, um, of people who used to live in the park. So yeah, so that's it's a very different landscape than in, in Africa than in, in South America. Much more densely populated areas altogether. 